Gear 5th was originally supposed to be very different, including the idea that the base form of the entire transformation was going to turn Luffy into a giant. And then instead of Kaido being four Luffy's tall, Luffy would have been four Kaido's tall. Plus in this video, Oda also reveals how Gear 5th actually works, the Hindu deity that inspired it, and some very juicy secret plot lines that never made it into the manga. Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. My name is Liam and according to Etch, your Oda, here is how Gear 5th works. Thanks to some detailed notes revealed in volume four of The Road to Laugh Tale, we now understand Oda's thought process behind our goofy Rabasan God, which is that Gear 5th, quote, utilizes the power of imagination, which I think explains a lot because we're now dealing with the idea that anything Luffy can think of, he can make happen. And it's very much the culmination of everything the series has been building towards because Luffy has always been using this power. I mean, for example, when he saw Genzo's pinwheel during the Arlong arc, he went on to become a pinwheel himself. And as we would later discover, pinwheels are of course the natural counter to sharks. Just like how nature's natural counter to crocodiles is eating them, which Luffy also tried. The imagination thing is, well, it's just a lot more literal now with Gear 5th. And in Oda's notes, he also stated that Gear 5th is simply freedom. It gives Luffy the ability to quote, really cut loose. So it really has no limits. Now with that said, here are its limits. But first here's Monkey D Doggo interrupting the video demanding a pat. Luckily enough for everyone who subscribes as a result of this video, this here good boy will receive one pat. So subscribe generously and let's turn this good boy into the king of pats. All right, drawbacks of Gear 5th now. Oda has been aware of this from the beginning. In fact, his notes do make mention of the fact that unlike awakened Paramecias, awakened Zoans carry risk. That risk being the animalistic nature within the fruit that can overwhelm the human personality. A great example of this is actually Monster Chopper, just, just in reverse actually. I guess it's more like the human aspect overwhelmed his calm, cotton candy loving reindeer nature. But aside from Luffy and Chopper though, to date the only other confirmed awakened Zoans are the Jailer Beasts of Impel Down, which to be fair, they'd mastered their awakenings quite well, especially Mino Koala whose awakened nature should have been to just park itself in a tree and then eat toxic leaves for the rest of its pathetic existence. Speaking as a qualified Australian, koalas are just one of those creatures that are good at absolutely nothing. And the only reason why they still exist at all is because their food is toxic to every other creature, including us humans. And speaking of humans, that is the identified weakness of the Hitohit no Mi model Nika. There is a very real danger that Luffy could lose himself in the overly joyous madness that is the sun god. And there were definitely some early sketches that hinted at this occurring. Some of the earliest concepts we've seen for the awakening have Luffy looking significantly more sinister and dare I say, kinda cool, which is all very unluffy like This is another great example of Oda's design process though. He takes his Haradric cube, puts in a super sleek, cool and powerful standard shonen-y looking design. Then he drops an entire bucket of goof inside, swirls it around a bit and bam, out pops one wacky One Piece character, ready to piss off all of the edgy shonen fans on internet forums. Oda does have another curious note here though, where he states that this awakening actually happening is a miracle. And Luffy said it himself, anything's possible now. Gear 5th has given Luffy the freedom to fight in a way that defies common sense. Even the ones taking his attacks are affected. Which is confirming something that's been you know, slightly contentious on the internet, which was, is Luffy's devil fruit actually affecting other people or was this just a stylistic choice by Oda? But this confirms that Luffy's powers do extend to those around him, which is kind of insane to think Think about. Because if he were to use that imagination a little bit more, then who knows what he'd be capable of making happen. Not just making his enemies vulnerable and wacky, but potentially even beefing up his allies. And let me just remind you of how dangerous Luffy's imagination can be. As it was the mind brain that conjured Fishman Nami, and who also wanted to become a Luffy centaur by taking Kinemon's legs and sticking them on his rubber butt. So we have just entered a whole new realm of Luffy shenaniganry. But it makes a lot of retrospective sense. For example, Gear Second was never really a solid bastion of logic. So much as it was an amorphous goo of, oh, this is kind of vague, but hey, it beat a cow man, a cat man, and a vampire penis neck. So hey, it kind of works for me. Knowing what we do now about the imagination and the stuff, it's pretty perfect. Luffy needed to come up with gear second after losing to Kuzan. So his childlike rubber brain thought to itself, hmm, how do I beat cold man? I know, I become hot man, because hot is how to beat cold. And then he proceeds to generate steam from, checks notes, 
nowhere. Question mark, question mark, question mark equals Luffy is now stronger and faster. Not because of anything that makes sense, but more because his devil fruit has always allowed Luffy to fight in ways that simply defy logic. And the Road to Laugh Tale booklet also gives a bunch of early Gear 5th Luffy cartoony sketches. The eye popping and the kind of Roadrunner style dash actually made it into the manga, but it's really cool to see more of the cartoon tropes that Oda played around with and which we could still potentially see in the future. One of my favorites being the idea that Luffy has this Frankie style function where his chest opens up and there's like a literal stamina bar that he can monitor. I think that is so much fun. The thing about this is that it's not just the perfect fruit for Luffy, it is also the perfect fruit for Oda. This man has one of the finest imaginations that humanity has ever conjured and Gear 5th to him is the narrative device that allows Oda maximum freedom as an author to draw whatever he wants without needing to explain any boring logical in-world reasoning for each and everything. It's just really brilliantly set up. After 25 years, most authors probably would have written themselves into a corner with just rule after rule after rule, but Oda has been specifically writing in a way that gives him increasing freedom as an author. All right, something very, very fascinating now. In Oda's notes for the final attack against Kaido, it is labeled as Hanuman Monkey God. And for anyone who isn't aware, Hanuman is an Indian monkey deity thought to be the inspiration for Sun Wukong. And whilst Hanuman has not been mentioned in the series, I just lied because he actually has. The final attack ended up being named Bajrang Gun, and another one of Hanuman's many, many names is Bajrang Bali. So Luffy's final attack, smiting Kaido down from the sky, is named after a monkey deity. And I also just wanted to point out one story featuring Hanuman because it has a lot of very, how shall we say, familiar elements to the One Piece. In one retelling of his existence as part where Hanuman leaps towards the sun, mistakenly believing that it is a delicious fruit. Meanwhile, in One Piece, we have a boy who mistakenly ate a sun god thinking that it was a harmless fruit. To bounties now, and this booklet gives us the oddly specific 66 highest bounties in One Piece. None of it's new information, but it does take the time to point out that Luffy, Kid, and Law are all equally the sixth highest bounty holders in the series, meaning that the three billion number could be even more well thought out than we thought, because this tie gives us a 666. And given that two of these sixth place contenders wield massive Ds, these devil references here are pretty undeniable. And if Luffy and Law were macadamias, then we could even call them Ds nuts. Apart from that, there's also some fun collector data, like the fact that Sanji is currently the 37th highest bounty holder in One Piece, but he's also tied for that place with both Cavendish and Pecoms. So that's three very emotionally charged blondes. Meanwhile, Zoro currently has the 40th highest bounty in One Piece, but he is also tied with both Gecko Moria and Basil Hawkins. So I do think that our monster trio needs some serious number raising after one. To put this into some perspective, Ulti, Baron Tamago, and even the long gone Pedro are still worth more than Zoro and Sanji. But also good on Usopp because he is the 55th highest bounty holder in the series, although that spot is also shared with both Massacre Soldier Killer and everyone's favorite publicly urinating rooster, Bartolomeo. All right, it is time for secrets now because this Road to Laugh tale revealed to us some stories that never were. For example, there is a character who was cut from Wano named Kingpin Kurokoma, who was the rival of Boss Hyogoro and actually the reason why Kinemon kind of screwed everything up by kidnapping Koyama, the small white boar. And Koyama very cutely means small mountain, by the way, which is so adorable because he's like a little small mountain god. Kurokoma was briefly mentioned in the manga by Kinemon and Denjiro, but this whole thing was essentially a grand plot by Kurokoma to use the mountain god to destroy the Hyogoro family. Instead, Oda did something a bit counterintuitive for storytelling, and instead of showing Kurokoma, he just told us that he existed. And essentially, we ended up saving at least two pages of space by booting him from the series, potentially even more, because when you introduce a character like this, then you also need to give them some sort of conclusion or epilogue or development down the line. It's just amazing though, because for as long as Wano has been, it could have been infinitely longer with stuff like this. Another example is Izo and Kiku because their backstory was supposed to be a fair bit more fleshed out. In the Road to Laugh Tale booklet, these two children have a whopping four page interaction with Kozuki Oden. Whereas in the manga, this whole backstory ended up boiling down to basically two panels. And yes, I use the word boiling there as an intentional pun because their entire conversation takes place over a pot of Odin and it's a really fun interaction that has me kind of torn. On the one hand, we were saved four whole pages and yes, that, that's a lot. If every vassal had a story like that, then we've saved two to three whole chapters, which is like an entire month of One Piece. But on the other hand, which Kiku is now missing, we missed out on spending time with these characters in their most vulnerable and raw states during the flashback. And for Izo, that time is particularly important because he ended up doing the death thing. It's that classic problem where Oda is so ambitious with the scale of characters that he just doesn't have the time needed to really flesh them all out. Oh, and we have another great example of this with Yamato and Fuga. This was a relationship 
relationship that came into the story at the 11th hour, but Yamato and the number Fuga have a much more detailed backstory that we never got to see. Apparently Fuga being, well, how shall we say, a little bit less intelligent than anyone would like to be, accidentally ate a smile fruit, which is why half of his body is a horse. This is something I really didn't think about because he came from Punk Hazard where there were like so many people who were half human, half horse, or half something. So Fuga could have been a very early experiment that later inspired what Caesar and Law did, but no, he actually ate a smile fruit and he was lucky enough for it to have worked. However, this made Kaido very, very angry and Fuga's fellow numbers started making fun of him for his horse legs. And at this moment entered a young Yamato who said that Fuga's legs looked quote, really cool. And from that moment on, they became friends. The reasoning being because there's an empathetic parallel between the two because Yamato also ate a devil fruit out of pure hunger with Kaido not intending for that fruit to be consumed. So very Luffy-like but apparently also very Fuga-like. So they bonded over fruit-based mishaps and Yamato more or less cured Fuga's depression, which is why he then went on to switch sides during the raid. But it's another one of those things where I just, I feel like you either do it or you don't do it. Because as it stands, if I didn't know this backstory, then the whole Fuga element just seems a little bit random and like he doesn't really need to be in the story at all. Whereas all it takes is one page of backstory to justify his existence and make me actually care for him. And I do now, in fact, he's the only number I give any shits about and I I am so, so glad that this was revealed because it adds the kind of depth that a whole host of Wano characters are, in my opinion, you know, kind of lacking. Again, though, even if it's only one page with Fuga, those pages do add up. And if we go on to give depth like that to each and every character, well, we definitely wouldn't be talking about how Wano is currently four years long and how crazy that is. We would be looking at how Wano is five to six years long and how insane that would be. It really makes me want like a director's cut of One Piece, which I would fully expect to be pure garbage in terms of pacing because it would just be so, so much slower. But for someone like me who craves to know all of the things about fictional pirates, I think it would ultimately be a bit more satisfying. And if you crave satisfaction via fictional pirates, then here is another video and I look forward to seeing you there.